Hey, good morning, Chahi family. Uh, great to be able to come to you uh, one more time uh, from my porch here in Virginia. I hope that you're doing well today and glad that we can have uh, this time together, even though it's not nearly as good uh, as being together in person. I'm grateful for the technology that exists to let us still uh, experience some things together. Uh, I've enjoyed our sing times over these last four weeks and just getting to see uh, different members of our Chehi family and being able to sing together and worship together. Again, even though we're not in the same room, uh, through the Holy Spirit, we have the ability to be together as, as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I've been grateful uh, for these opportunities, and I want to thank you for taking time to join me today. Uh, we've been talking about hope over these last uh, few weeks, and going to kind of finish up that thought today. But I, I want to begin uh, by talking a little bit about expectations, right? Expectations. We all have expectations in life of certain things, of events, of experiences. And when our expectations are not met, we get frustrated, right? Unmet expectations always lead to frustration. It's one of the things I always share in relationship coaching and marriage counseling uh, is that expectations are so important because unmet expectations always lead to frustration. Now, in, in our lives, we're, we're going to experience unmet expectations, right? As we deal and interact with each other as people, there's going to be times that, that, that things, people, experiences fall short of our expectation. And we get frustrated, and, and sometimes rightly so. But I, I don't want us to so much think about human uh, expectations or the frustrations that we experience because of that. But I want us to think about what about when God doesn't do what we thought he was going to do? What, what about then when, when our expectation that we had an expectation that God was going to do something and he didn't do it or he didn't do it the way we thought he should or we've been praying about something and we're not seeing the answer that we'd hoped for or longed for and we know God could do the thing that we're asking him or wanting him to do, but he doesn't. What then? And when our expectations are not met, sometimes it makes hope hard and faith hard. And to think about that, I, I want us to, to think about Jesus' disciples, the, the 12, that were the, the ones that were invited to be Jesus' closest followers, to, 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 to live with him and to travel with him and to do ministry with him and to be taught by him and to be discipled by him. And I, I want us to think about their expectations of Jesus and what they experienced and what happened when Jesus died, what happened when he came to life and rose from the dead and how their expectations had to be shaped and changed. And even when Jesus did not do what they thought he was going to do, and even when Jesus didn't do what they most wanted him to do and thought he should do, we're going to see what Jesus did instead and what he taught them. And I believe from that we can learn a powerful lesson for our, our lives today. And not just learn a lesson, but I think we can be shaped and encouraged and challenged and motivated to live for the purposes of God. Because ultimately, that's what experiencing God's hope is, is all about. It's, it's not just about having a hope that is something that we just have and, okay, I have this hope and that's great. No, the hope that God gives us leads us to a life of purpose. And so I, I want to get there in just a few minutes. But let's think about uh, Jesus' disciples, his followers. And you know they were a pretty rough crew. They were fishermen, a tax collector, ordinary guys. But these ordinary men came to believe and put their faith in Jesus as their Messiah. And in, in their expectation, in their minds, the Messiah, God's promised deliverer, was going to be someone who brought an end to the political oppression that they lived under. They were occupied by the Romans. They, they lived under Roman control and Roman taxation. And they believed that when the Messiah came, he would bring in the kingdom of God, the rule and the reign of God, and would overthrow the political oppression that they lived under. And they had, they had expectations for Messiah. They had expectations for the kingdom of God. And again, for Second Temple Jews, the Messiah would be a military king who would vanquish the Romans and bring God's righteous rule to earth. And, and they really believed that that was happening. They, they believed Jesus was the Messiah. And they believed all the things that he was doing pointed to that. And they did. His teaching, his healings, the, the other miracles that he did, they all pointed their faith to the, an expectation that Jesus was the Messiah and the kingdom 
was coming. But then something happened that shattered their hope. Jesus died. Jesus died. And when Jesus died, the disciples' hope was shattered. And maybe you can identify because you could say, I know what it's like to have hope shattered. There was a moment in my life, I've experienced a moment in my life where I felt like hope had been shattered. The phone rang and it was the news of a loved one who passed away unexpectedly. It was a doctor's call that told me about a diagnosis that I was facing. It it was a disappointment or something that I was expecting was going to happen, a place I was going to get to be. and, And hope was shattered when that thing didn't happen, when that expectation didn't come true. And so the disciples' hope has been shattered, right? And and just, again, if you could use your imagination for a moment and just put yourselves in their shoes or their sandals, if you will, they, they have given up everything to follow Jesus. And they've seen, they've seen evidence to back up their belief, the, 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 the teaching, the miracles, like we've already talked about their, their evidence and their hope in Jesus is so real. And then he dies and they didn't have any expectation for a dead Messiah. And even though Jesus had told them that the Messiah would die and rise again, it it didn't connect. They didn't understand. That didn't make any sense to them. And and they, they, they just didn't have a grid to even wrap their mind around that. And so their hope has been shattered. Everything, everything that they had given their lives for was gone. Now, for the disciples, we know what happens. They spend... Friday night and Saturday and into Sunday morning in deep discouragement and disillusionment, depression. Right? They are, they're, they're, they're distraught. Their, their Messiah, their deliverer, their rescuer is dead. Everything they hoped for is gone. But then on that Sunday morning, the disciples get word from the women, the tomb is empty. And then Mary Magdalene comes and says, Jesus is alive. I saw him. And then that night, even though they had disbelieved, that night Jesus appears to his followers and they see him and he's alive. And once again, their hopes begin to soar. And for their hopes, now that Jesus was alive again, their hopes was now that that Jesus was going to set up the kingdom, that he was going to overthrow Rome and that finally what they waited for was going to happen. But as you probably know, and as we're about to see, things actually turned out very differently. And so I want us to think about what is it that we do when things turn out differently than we hoped for? You know, in 2020, I think all of us can say our year has turned out differently than we hoped for, right? None of us foresaw the things that that we've gone through as a country and with COVID and all the changes and the loss and the disappointment and the fears and anxiety and the uncertainty, all those things that this, this season has brought besides sickness and disease and just the myriad of ways that it's impacted all of our lives. I mean, we're not together at Chehi this summer like we all hoped and thought we would be. And when, when those things happen, when our expectations don't happen the way we thought, and when hope seems hard, what is, what is God going to do for us? What does he offer us? And what is he not going to do just for us, but what is he calling us to do? So look with me. If you have your Bible, Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And we're going to begin in verse 3. And, and there we're going to find an encounter with the risen Jesus and his disciples. And he is going to engage them with truth that they need to hear and with a mission that they are going to be called to live out. And that really is going to be the key. This mission is going to be the key because Jesus is not going to do what they expect. He's not going to do what they hoped for, but he's going to call them to live for a purpose. And that is going to be the key for them living with hope. So Acts chapter 1, and let's begin with just verse 3. It says, He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Now notice a couple of things here. It says he presented himself alive. And, and this, is, this is so important because it's the resurrection of Jesus on which our faith hangs. If, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a Christian, Right, Your faith hangs on and is built on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right, That is the distinguishing watershed, watershed mark of Christianity is that we believe that Jesus rose from the dead. We believe that there's evidence that points us to our faith in a risen Jesus. And for the followers, the original followers of Jesus, they certainly experienced lives that 
not only proclaimed that Jesus was risen, but they were changed by the resurrection and they lived and proclaimed and that message began to spread in Jerusalem and then around the world. And, and we'll get a little bit to about, about how and why that happened. But, but we believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And that is the thing that our faith rests on. My faith rests on a risen Jesus. I have lots of questions. I don't understand many things. There are times where I don't understand what God is doing or why God has allowed certain things. There's times where, where my faith is, is, is shaken. And yet in all of those moments, I can always go back to this. Jesus rose from the dead. And everything that he proclaimed is true. He predicted his death and resurrection. And my faith is built on a risen Savior who's reigning in heaven and returning one day for his people. And so Jesus is alive. And that alone gives us hope. But let's go on. It says he appeared to them and he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. And and no doubt as he's speaking about the kingdom of God, the rule and the reign of God which Jesus came to announce, which Jesus came to inaugurate, and ultimately through his death death and resurrection, Jesus came to establish in the hearts and the lives of those who believe in him and trust him and follow him. And one day he is coming to establish that kingdom on earth. But the disciples thought that was going to be right then, right? That was their expectation. Jesus is alive. He's going to establish the kingdom. But notice verse four, while he was staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Jesus says, I want you to wait here in Jerusalem. I'm going to do something. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit upon you. When I ascend back to the Father, I'm going to send the Spirit, and he is going to enable you and empower you to live for me and for my kingdom and for the mission that I'm going to give you. But they had to wait. And I don't know about you, but, but waiting is hard. And, and we live in a culture, we live in a society where we don't like to wait, right? I, I don't like to wait. I don't like to wait in lines. I don't like to wait for things, right? We're, we're used to an instant society, right? Instant communication. We send a text message and we expect a test ma- text message back right away. And if somebody doesn't text us back within a, a minute or two, we think, are they ignoring me? Are they dead? What's going on? Is something wrong? Are they mad at me? Right? We're so used to instant, right? And access to any content we want, questions we want. We just ask Siri, right? We watch TV on demand. We watch movies on demand. We live in an, an on-demand, instant access, instant gratification world. But God is not a God who does things in, inst- in an instant. He works things out through and over time. And, and, and so he's going to tell them to wait because he is going to give them a mission that they could never accomplish in their own strength or ability or power. So he says, you have to wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. He's going to give you power to do something that I'm calling you to do. But the disciples, as they're hearing wait and Holy Spirit, they don't really fully understand what Jesus is saying. And like a lot of us, they're not, they're not really deeply listening to understand what Jesus is saying. They're thinking about the next question, right? Sometimes when we're listening to somebody, we're not really listening. We're just thinking about what we want to say next or the next question we want to ask. And notice what the disciples are thinking about. Verse six, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They're like, uh, yeah, the, the whole weight thing, Holy Spirit thing, that's beautiful. That's great. But let's get to the real question. Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Is this the time? We, we have an expectation, right? We have an expectation of what you're going to do. This is the time. We're ready for the kingdom. And you remember, even if we go back before the, the crucifixion, before that happened, they were anticipating the kingdom. And James and John were angling for top positions in the kingdom. And they even got their mom in on it, right? They got their mom to go to Jesus and ask for them to be able to sit at Jesus' left and right hand. And so they're all expecting that the kingdom is visibly, physically going to happen on earth right now. And they, they, they can't perceive or see anything else. But God, God's kingdom, while coming and inaugurated and announced and proclaimed by Jesus, was and is coming in a very different way than they expected. 
you know, we're often in a hurry to get to the end, to get to the, to the ultimate thing, but God is never in a hurry. God is never in a hurry. He works things out perfectly in his time, but he's never in a hurry. And Jesus answers them. And he, his answer should give us insight as well as what we should do when God doesn't do what we thought he was going to do. Right? Because that, that's when it comes to having hope, we have to wrestle with what do I do when God doesn't do what I thought he was going to do? What do I do when God doesn't do what I think he should have done? Notice what Jesus says in verse 7. He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. He simply tells them, That isn't your business. It's not your business to know when the kingdom is going to be established on earth. And so it's a very kind way of saying, None of your business. Right? You know, sometimes we want to know things that we don't have any business knowing. And most of us, if we could remember back to our growing up years, we like to listen in to our parents talking, right? We like to try to eavesdrop. My kids, they love to try to eavesdrop on my wife and I and listen in. They, they want to know what's going on. They want in on it. And, and that's okay sometimes, but sometimes we're talking about things they don't need to know about, things that they don't need to worry about, right? And it's not appropriate for them to listen in. And Jesus, is not being unkind. And God is not being unkind when he's saying we don't need to know. He's saying there is something more that I want you to be focused on, which is the mission that you have. And this isn't your concern. The times, the seasons, when, it's not your concern. And there's some things that we just can't understand. There's things that God is doing right now in your life and in this world that if God told us, we wouldn't even believe him. God's always doing more than we can imagine. So he's not going to give them an answer that they want. He's not going to fulfill the expectation that they have. But he's going to give them a mission. Look at verse 8. He says, but you will receive power. It's not for you to know when the kingdom will come to earth. But he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in, in Jerusalem and in Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And so he says, you're going to receive power. And it's the, the, the Greek word there is the word that we get our English word dynamite from. He says, you're going to receive power. You want to know when, and you want to know how, but that's not what, what God wants you to know. But what he does want you to know is that you're going to receive power. And that power is going to enable you to live for my purpose. Right? God had a purpose for his disciples. God has a purpose for you. And he says, you're going to have power to accomplish what I'm asking you to do. You're going to be my witnesses. And that's the word we get our word martyr from. And indeed, as Jesus is speaking to these disciples, all but John will die for their faith in Christ and their testimony and their witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And even John will spend his last years in exile on the island of Patmos. And so he says, you're going to have power and you're going to be my witnesses. You're going to, you're going to take the message of the kingdom, the good news of the gospel, the good news that, that God has invited anyone and everyone to be part of his kingdom. You're going to be my witnesses, and you're going to do that right here in Jerusalem where I was crucified and where I rose from the dead. And then you're going to go out into the countryside, the surrounding area, into Judea and spread the message. And then you're going to go cross-culturally. You're going to go to the Samaritans. And the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. But he says, these people that for so long I've had hate and animosity between them, you're going to go to them with the good news that they too are included and invited in the kingdom of God if they'll come by faith and receive Jesus as Savior. right? Because the gospel breaks down every barrier. Because God sent his son Jesus, not just as the Messiah and the Savior of the Jewish people of Israel, but he sent him as the Savior of the whole world. And he sent him to offer the kingdom of God, the rule and the reign of God, to anyone and every anyone who wanted to live in and under his kingdom rule. And that, that kingdom rule begins when a person believes in Jesus and on Jesus as their Savior and receives salvation, forgiveness of their sin, and eternal life. They become a citizen of God's kingdom. And, and, and the Holy Spirit that was promised in Acts comes and lives in them and in you and in me. 
and we become a citizen of God's kingdom. We can become an ambassador of his kingdom, a kingdom that is now here in our hearts and in our lives and is manifested and represented by Jesus' church. But one day, we'll experience his ultimate fulfillment and reality when Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom rule righteously here on earth forever and ever. And so he says, it's not for you to know the time. It's not for you to know the season, but you have a mission. You're going to be my witnesses to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, right? Cross culture, and then to the ends of the earth, because God desires that people of every tribe and of every tongue would know that he loves them, that Jesus died for them, that they can be forgiven of their sin, that they can be restored to a relationship with their creator, that they can know him and worship him and serve him and one day be gathered around his throne and live in his kingdom forever and ever. In fact, in Revelation chapter five, we see this amazing and beautiful picture of that reality where John seeing into the future and seeing into heaven, he sees people of every tribe and of every tongue gathered around the throne, praising and worshiping Jesus forever and ever. And that is a true reality. And in the meantime, before that true reality happens, we as his followers have been invited to be part of the mission of proclaiming the kingdom and seeing the people of the nations come to faith in Jesus. And again, whether that happens right where we live in our city or our town, or it happens in our region, or it happens cross-culturally in our region, or whether it happens in the ends of the earth, we have been called and given a mission. Listen, it's a mission that for the disciples and for you and I can sometimes be difficult, dangerous, and even deadly. But it is a kingdom mission given to every follower of Jesus Christ. And Jesus' kingdom is coming one day. And that is our hope that we've been called into a living relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. We've been forgiven of our sin. We've been adopted into his family. We're a son or a daughter of God, and we are a citizen of his kingdom. And it's not for us to know when Jesus is returning. It's not for us to know all of the things that we wish we knew. And sometimes God's not going to do what we hoped he was going to do. And just like for the disciples, right? Their hope was shattered when Jesus died. But God knew exactly what he was doing and their hope was restored. But then their hope had to be changed because again, their hope was still that the kingdom was happening right now, but the kingdom wasn't happening right now. But instead, God gave them a mission. And I want you to, God has, has given you a mission as well, a mission to live for him, to live for his kingdom, to live for his purposes, to share his love and his grace and his hope with a world that desperately needs to know it and to see it. And while it's always been true, I think now more than ever, we see a world that is desperately in need of hope, desperately in need of Jesus. And we have the gospel, the good news of the kingdom, that there is a God. And this God loves the world that he made. And this God sent his son into the world to die for those who had rebelled against him, you and me and everyone else. And Jesus bore the penalty and the wrath of our sin. And he took it and absorbed it in himself he died in our place, but he rose from the dead. That's what makes the message of Jesus different than every other religion and every other spiritual message that's out there. It's not a message about you do this or do that or find this or discover this. It's a message that God came to us and for us. And Jesus rose from the dead. Our faith hangs on that. And then he's given us a mission to live for his kingdom and to live for his purposes. And if you want to be filled with hope, and you want to experience and live out this hope, you need to engage in the mission that God's called for you to live in. Again, he's not just called for us to retreat into a corner and hang on to a hope that one day things will be better. He's called us to go out into this world and engage it with the love and the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I want to give you three things really quickly uh, to encourage you and to challenge you about how do I do that. Number one, trust God's promises. Trust God's promise. He's given you precious and powerful promises. One of my favorite ones is Luke chapter 12, verse 32, where Jesus said, Fear not, little flock, for it is the Father's good pleasure to give you his kingdom. You know, when I'm overwhelmed and when I'm feeling anxious and weighed down and discouraged, that, that truth, that verse, those words of Jesus have so powerfully encouraged me. Fear not, little flock, for it's the Father's good pleasure to give you 
his kingdom. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, as Jesus commissioned his disciples, he says, I am with you even to the end of the age. Right? And so as, as you're sent out by God to share the hope of Jesus, remember his promises and remember that he's with you. Number two, live for his purposes. Live for his purpose. You have purpose. You have a light. You have been shaped and made. You are created in the image of God. You've been saved by God and you have purpose. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says we are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You have a purpose. Give your life to the purposes of God. Surrender. Say, say I don't want to live for myself because that's a hopeless way to live. I want to live for Jesus and his purposes. Trust his promises. Live for his purposes. And then thirdly, depend on his power. Right? We can't do it in our own strength. We never could pretend to do it in our own strength, but we don't have to. The Holy Spirit has been given to every believer, and he lives in you. And he gives us grace and strength and power in the enabling to do what God's called us to do. Paul experienced that power, and he says, I, he says, I, have, lear- I have discovered, I've learned something. He says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, Philippians 4.13. And and what Paul was saying simply is that he could handle any circumstance that God allowed him to be in. He could handle any circumstance, whether it was good or whether it was bad, whether it was easy or painful or difficult. And again, he, he said those words, he penned those words in prison. He says, I can handle any situation because God gives me strength. And God will give you strength to do what he's called you to do. Trust his promise. Live for his purpose depend on his power. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I want to thank you for spending a part of your day with me. I hope that you will live a life filled with the hope that God wants you to have, and that you will live for the purpose for which God made you, to spread the good news of the gospel of God's kingdom, which is here in the lives of his followers and is coming one day. God bless you. Have a great day. Live for Jesus.